Hey everybody, this is Brent from Wolf on Wall Street Trade with a market update for the week ending February 7th, 2020. Interesting week. So China comes back from the Lunar New Year holiday and global markets soar higher on the week. So were these Wuhan virus fears overblown? Uh, we'll take a look at stocks. We'll take a look at bonds, commodities, currencies, volatility, everything, market breadth and central bank policy and try to put a message of the market. Actually, in this case, a message of the markets together. Okay, this is a daily chart, the S&P 500. So picking up from last week, we had uh, really mixed sectors, S&P sectors and mixed averages. So we had some that were almost done with a second leg decline, first leg, second leg, and some were just starting and some hadn't quite started yet, like the NASDAQ. So we had a very mixed picture. This week, you can see this is the S&P up almost 3.2% on the week, makes a new record high, retraces all this Wuhan virus uh, concern, almost as if the Wuhan virus was actually beneficial for the economy and for the market. The Dow Jones was basically about the same, about uh, 3% on the week, made a new high over here. And you can see this is kind of a hanging man candle, so a loss of momentum as it got up here to the January record high. And notice, you know, the S&P 500 came right off the 50-day moving average where it closed the week before. Dow had uh, broke a little bit below it and then back up. The NASDAQ outperformed on the week. So it was right here last week. This was like a flag and it was just starting to kind of break below that flag. Wasn't a decisive break yet. And this is Monday. You have a uh, Harami or inside day. That is a reversal candle. So the downside momentum reversed and NASDAQ did the best up four and a half percent on the week. Here's small caps or IWM and they were up about 2.7% on the week. This was one of the averages that had almost hit a second leg decline. Here's the first consolidation. The second leg started. It fell just about 1% short, a little less than 1% short. So uh, here's this week and notice where it closed at the end of the week. It started off the beginning of the week on Monday. Actually, Russell 2000 futures looked pretty good Monday morning before the open from Sunday's open right up until before the cash open. So small caps in essence, kind of led the market early in the week higher. And you can see kind of led the market down into some softness late in the week, closing at this 50 day moving average. I'm going to run through all the S&P sectors, update the charts, but uh, the best performing was technology sector up 4.6%. The material sector, which did hit the downside target last week, it had made two equal legs lower. So it was one of the best performing up four and a quarter percent this week. And then the healthcare sector, which was the same scenario as materials had hit a second leg downside move at the end of last week was up 3.9%. The worst performing or the only S&P sector to close red this week was utilities. You might remember last week, it was the only sector to close green. It's a defensive sector. So with that said, let's breeze through some of these S&P sector charts. You can see the time frame up here. So this is the 30 minute chart of the material sector. Here's the first leg down consolidation, second leg down. It was actually the target right here at 58. And this is this week. So pretty much just wiped out that whole second leg down and hit resistance up here. Uh, that's about 61.25 and kind of backed off at the end of the week. The main takeaway is, you know, a big bounce as it was the worst performer last week, one of the worst performers. It's a little bit more than a dead cat bounce, but ran into some resistance over here. The energy sector just got walloped. So this week it, it closed up. It had a little bounce over here. Um, its decline was actually three legs down of about five and a half percent each. There's one, there's two, and here's the third. And here it is this week. So it didn't do anything to change the technical outlook. This could even be a bearish flag kind of consolidation under uh, resistance over here. Here's the financial sector, XLF. We had this big five or six week range. And as of last week, it had put in a first leg down consolidation and held that didn't start the second leg. So here is the rally this week did hit that resistance of what is now about eight week resistance over here uh, near 31. Last week, when I went through all these sectors, I showed that the growth sensitive groups within them were leading them lower. So this is regional banks. So here's this week. And as you can see, it didn't do anything to change the technical outlook, ran into some resistance here. We have lower highs. OK, it did not make a higher high and we have lower lows over here. So did not do anything to change that outlook. And compared to the financial sector here and uh, regional banks here, you can still see that it is still weak and leading lower. Unlike financials that met not a higher high, but at least an equal high, didn't get that same action over here in the regional banks. So. They're technically still leading lower, even though they bounced this week. 
Here's the industrial sector. This 82, 82, 25 area has been like a key support resistance level. And last week we had ended below it. So this is this week. This is one of the few sectors that actually did improve its technical outlook because it made a higher high here relative to over here. So that is one improvement in S&P sectors from last week's bounce or rally. And as I was saying last week, the Dow transports were leading lower. So here's the Dow transports. They had made one leg down consolidation and they started the second leg down. They did fall short of that downside target. So bounced into this week. And as you can see, uh, a really key level for the transports is 10,950 right here. And that's where it found resistance this week on its bounce. Relative to the industrial sector, you can see uh, transports in blue and the industrials over here. So did not make that higher high like industrials did. Now here's the key sector. This whole week, it really led to the upside. This is technology. This is the uh, December, January uptrend that it had broken. And then last week, it was looking more like this, like a little bear flag that had just started to break. So this week found support right here. You can see that level is 95. So I have changed the trend lines and it bounced or rallied right back above this trend. So this is the most heavily weighted, the most influential sector. I have been telling members for a while, this is going to be the last sector to break down. And when it does break down, it's going to really weigh on the broader market. The Dow, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500 have a lot of exposure to tech. Small caps, not so much. Getting back to that um, growth sensitive groups leading the market, this is the semiconductors. So last week, they had made a uh, first leg down, a bearish consolidation, and started a second leg down, fell just short of that target, which is right down here. So this is this week did not change the technical outlook in that it did not get back above this major trend like technology did. And uh, this is a growth sensitive area that tends to lead technology. Here's semiconductors in blue overlaid on technology and normalized technology made a higher high over here relative to over here. The semis did not. Here is a 15 minute chart of consumer staples XLP. This is a defensive sector. Looks pretty good to me. Almost a breakout really of this range that has been trading in. And here's a little more perspective on a 60 minute chart. This has had a really solid trend. This is when I told members that I thought it looked like a really good buy over here. Near 61.75, I was hoping it hit this trend line, but came close down to 62. And uh, this is what's done since. So uh, let me show you the daily trend, this trend line. That's a solid uptrend all the way back from January 2019. I really like the defensive sectors. Here's utilities, the only sector to close down last week, a little bit more than a half a percent, not a big deal. But this sector, again, defensive, second best performing sector this year. Technology is the best. So that's an interesting dichotomy. You have technology, kind of a growth uh, sector on one side and utilities, a defensive sector on the other. Here's the daily chart. I mean, look at this breakout. This is my preference. If I had to be long the market, I would be in these defensive sectors. Like I said last week, I think those are the ones that are going to outperform moving forward. And just look at this trend on a daily chart. This sector popped up on our radar May of 2018 over here, started acting better. It has trended up. This is when the market was selling off. The S&P lost 20%. It had a dip. Yeah, but it didn't have anything like that. And this is 2019 into 2020, still performing really well. You can see why I like them. Okay, so we're back to the 15 minute charts here. This is the healthcare sector, second most heavily weighted behind technology. Financials is right behind healthcare. So it's an important sector. This is the trend break. And this is what I was talking about last week in the beginning of this video. One leg down, two legs down. That was the target. Hit it right on the nose. This is this week's bounce. Uh, did not change the outlook, did not get back up above this primary trend, did not make a higher high. Here's a 15 minute chart of consumer discretionary. It is similar to tech in trend. It's also one of the fang heavy sectors. Amazon is the most heavily weighted component in this sector. This is how we ended last week. Similar to tech in that we had made a first leg down, breaking this primary trend and consolidated in a little bearish flag. And like tech, it held up. Okay, so it started to break last Friday, held up right here. This is the week. Also like tech, it did make a higher high over here relative to over here, but it is kind of tangling with this uptrend that it broke, back testing it, whereas technology is above that. This is consumer discretionary in red and green candlesticks, and this is the retail sector. 
it did lead consumer discretionary lower here. Here's the bounce on the week. Did not make a higher high like consumer discretionary relative to over here and ended in a little bit worse fashion. You know, we could say this could potentially be a bullish consolidation. This, we can't make that case. Here's another fang heavy sector, communications, uh, Facebook, Google, okay, in this sector. And like technology had a steeper uptrend in uh, January of 2020. And this is the December, January trend. So we got a break of that, a first leg down over here, a consolidation, it broke down a little bit more. This was the second leg measured move. So fell just short with the rally last week over here. So again, did not retake this trend, did not make a higher high. So it really didn't do anything to change the technical outlook of uh, kind of this bearish action over here. And finally, the third defensive sector, real estate, 15 minute chart. This is the week, so it didn't do much, but let me show you the sector to back out a little bit more. So it had a big move up here to resistance and it's basically backed off consolidating. This could be kind of like a bull flag, but it's just, you know, dipped a little bit below that. Still very positive, bullish looking price action here. And if we get a breakout above roughly this 4025 area, uh, it's going to go a lot higher. I would say you have probably another leg up equivalent to this. Here's the daily chart breakout here would be a major development for real estate. And remember, it is a defensive bond proxy sector like utilities and like consumer staples. For the week, VIX was down 18%. But if you consider the S&P 500 made a new record high, it actually showed a lot of relative strength. First, in that it didn't make an all-time new record low. And second, it didn't even touch this trend line at 12, which is really like about 23, 24% lower. So actually some relative strength in volatility on the week. Crude oil ended the week down two and a half percent. So this is just, you know, a spectacular decline. Notice where it's finding some temporary support over here at the bottom of this broadening range. You know, this is a 20 some odd percent move down. This is an area to watch. I think it's a really key level. And let me show you why go to a daily chart. This level from 2019. So right now, it's testing it like technical support. It hasn't shown any strong buying yet. It's just kind of technical support at that level for crude WTI crude futures. That's around $50 and 50 cents. So that is definitely a level you'll want to be watching. And let me just throw up the energy sector for some uh, perspective. So this is the energy sector in blue. You can see crude holding this area over here. But as far as energy, it already blasted through, made a lower low. And we're down here to the lowest level since 2016 when we are moving towards a global recession. Touching on gold real quick, this is the daily chart. So still, it looks constructive on this daily chart. Uh, gold did come down early in the week. You might remember the prior week we closed with this bullish ascending triangle. So here is this week. So this is just safe haven assets being dumped Monday. And then gold actually did pretty well up three days the rest of the week as uh, most most of those days, two of them anyway, the stock market was up. So that was interesting. Here's gold futures on a five minute chart with three C. So here's the decline. And we can actually see a positive divergence over here Tuesday into Wednesday. And we get this price action the rest of the week. So we did see some buyers early part of the week. I just am not completely sold that price has done enough to negate this kind of bearish flaggy looking price action. And I still think there could be a uh, risk of about another 1.75 to about 2% decline in gold if we get a break over here. Okay, so bonds, yields, this is a 10-year yield, interesting price action. This is what I pointed out last week. This is that uh, phase one trade deal optimism bounce in economic data from uh, September, October, November. This is why the phase one trade deal was being negotiated. The break of the trend was what is interesting. Let me zoom in a little bit. Bonds pulled back this week, but technically did not change the trend at all. They just filled this gap, which is the flight to safety trade as that Wuhan virus became a big concern for the market. So yields bounced with stocks, filled the gap, did not change the technical outlook in terms of the short term price action or in terms of this larger primary trend. Here's a daily chart of TLT. This has also been very high on my watch list as a buy candidate, big, powerful uh, bullish consolidation and breakout following in the footsteps of gold, which had a very similar consolidation. I did not want to chase this last week. So a pullback would be welcome. Let's take a closer look. Here's the pullback this week. I could buy this all the way down to 140, filling this gap. I think it would still be constructive price action. It did consolidate a little bit more than gold and 
I kind of like that better. I think the 3C chart looks a little bit better at this point for what has happened over in here. So here it is, TLT, two minute 3C chart, buying over here and a really, really strong 3C chart over here. This is not like distribution. This is kind of the signal that you, I'd expect to see on a consolidation or a pullback. But notice what 3C was doing into the lows of the week. It is very high on my watch list as a buy candidate. Here's the Aussie versus the US dollar. It is a commodity currency. It is Asia sensitive. So Wuhan virus fears, it's selling off. This is uh, this week over here, got a bounce. What did it do into the second part of the week? Sold off. That is a new low, the lowest level going back to 2009 coming out of the financial crisis. Here it is on a daily chart. So you can see the bounce early this week as markets went risk on, did not change the technical outlook, the posture and ended the week at a new low. This was a more risk off posture that we're seeing in the Aussie. It looks like the 30 year yield had that same consolidation, same break of the trend, did not do anything this week to change that outlook. This is more risk off in terms of the economic outlook. Let's see if we can pull this all together. S&P 500 daily chart coming into the week. China is coming back from the Lunar New Year and we have what you could consider a technical bounce off the 50 day moving average, but very, very strong week up over 3%. Doesn't make a lot of sense with the world's second largest economy virtually shut down. 80% of their economy is shut down and 90% of their exporters are not functioning. Yet the S&P, the NASDAQ and the Dow all make new record highs. So were the coronavirus or Wuhan virus fears overblown? Well, that is the narrative. Okay, narrative is just a story that we tell each other about why the market did what it did. It's earnings season. Maybe it's because of earnings. I don't think so. This is the Dow. This is Dow consensus forward EPS. Does not look like it was due to earnings. What this rally was about was the Chinese central bank, the PBOC flooding the market with liquidity. The PBOC does this anyway, ahead of the lunar new year to make sure businesses all have enough money. It's kind of almost like a Christmas holiday shopping season for China. So they put out a lot of money. Typically when China comes back from that lunar new year holiday, they start taking that money back out. But because of these Wuhan virus fears, they didn't do that. They didn't take the liquidity out and they doubled down on it. So when the market opened Monday, opened the new week, China had returned from that Lunar New Year holiday and the Shanghai Composite had dropped 7.7%. They had pulled out all the stops. They had banned short selling. They had discouraged funds from selling unless they had to meet redemptions. The PBOC cut the reverse repo rate by 10 basis points and they put out 1.2 trillion yuan. That's about $174 billion in liquidity Monday morning. That was enough to stabilize US and European stocks. They saw that China is doing something drastic, taking drastic measures. On Tuesday, the Shanghai Composite opened and it was down 3%. So the PBOC came in and they injected another 400 billion yuan net and added more stimulus measures. And the Shanghai Composite made a V-shaped reversal. And that's really what we saw leading all of this week. Here's the four week rolling average of PBOC's liquidity injections. So instead of the normal Lunar New Year where they flood the market right before and then let it roll off, they didn't let it roll off. They doubled down on it. They put more in a record net injection. We've never seen anything like this before. That's a record. That's 2 trillion yuan injected into the market. It didn't stop there. The Federal Reserve on Tuesday morning injected $94.5 billion between term and overnight repos. So you have China's central bank injecting trillions of yuan and you have the Fed injecting nearly $100 billion. This is a liquidity driven rally. They flooded the financial system with money. In China's case, a record amount. If you understand that, then you start to understand why everything looks the way it does. Just so you know, kind of where we are, the 60 minute chart, the SP 500, this is the July into early August, about 6% sell off. And this is peak recession fears, yield curves inverting. This is the bounce in September that didn't clear resistance over here. And this is where the phase one trade deal was announced. And this is where the balance sheet started expanding. Here is January of 2020. We've had a lot of red and yellow flags in this area. Let me show you what is going on right now. Here's copper. It's a growth asset. It's a risk asset. When copper, Dr. Copper makes a 10% decline or more like this, you have to pay attention. We got a little bounce this week here. Did not change the technical outlook in any way. 
I just added crude oil, USO in blue. These two assets are saying the exact same thing. They see this Wuhan virus as a big deal, a big problem for economic growth. They both bounced a little bit this week, didn't change the outlook at all. Now I've added the 30 year yield in white. This is where we saw problems developing into this high before the market sold off. Same message. And I showed the Australian dollar, what it was doing, making new lows all the way back to 2019. Here it is in red. All these asset classes are on the same page and these are big, sophisticated markets. Okay, you've got commodities, you've got currencies, and you've got rates. They're all saying the same thing. Stocks are saying something different because they've been driven by liquidity, billions of dollars in liquidity this last week. I haven't seen anything like this at least since 2018 before the market sold off. I backed up this chart. This is the SP500 in the candlesticks. This is that October to December sell-off. Copper was the one that gave the big warning first over here and the Australian dollar here in red. Crude dropped with the S&P. Now we have all these assets plus bond yields all dropping and the market doing the opposite, ignoring it like it was over in this area. And the last time we had another signal to this degree was back in 2015. We see copper, we see crude, we see the Australian dollar all leading the S&P lower. This is about a 15% decline. So the takeaway is pretty simple. You know, these assets reflected trouble coming. Stocks started reflecting that. Everything bounced this week, but we still have a huge, huge major divergence between currencies, bonds, and commodities on one side and equities that just got driven by hundreds of billions of dollars in liquidity, record liquidity measures that we've never seen before. You can see they come in, they usually go out. Heading into Friday, this SP500 on a five minute chart. So the way it ended the week, this could end up being a simple consolidation, bullish consolidation, because you do have the strong trend here. But small caps ended the week with relative weakness. And that was also mirrored in S&P 500 cyclical performance. Here's the S&P 500. And these are the kind of really growth sensitive uh, groups within that. So semiconductors, regional banks, the retail sector, uh, the material sector, they all started the week strong and they ended the week weaker like small caps. Here's the technology sector on the week, top performing sector. Didn't break down, it's holding the support at 99.50, but it did end the day a little bit ugly. So it ended off the lows, but with a bearish consolidation Friday afternoon. And like I just said, the growth sensitive areas were performing worse towards the end of the week. So here's semiconductors. Notice they did break down and close near the low of the day. And it's also worth mentioning that the only two sectors that closed green on Friday were both defensive consumer staples and real estate. Yields dropped about six to seven basis points. Here you can see the 10-year yield in white tracking with the S&P 500 early in the week, going into the end of the week, Thursday, some weakness, and then Friday. And the yield curve depicted the same thing. So here's the S&P 500. There's this week's bounce. Notice the yield curve flattened into inversion over here. Here's the bounce with yields early in the week and the yield curve flattened again towards the end of the week. And we got the same message from copper and crude. This is uh, copper futures. This is just humongous decline. Here's the bounce this week and copper crude both ended down on Friday. Growth sensitive areas were bouncing with the market early in the week and turning down late in the week, just like I was showing you on this intra week chart of the SP 500. And by the way, this is FXA. It's a proxy for the Australian dollar. So you can see doing the same thing, except this is a low that hasn't been seen in a decade since we were coming out of the financial crisis. On the supportive side, this is a small caps IWM daily held this 50 day moving average. So technical support. And one more thing before I forget, this is the NASDAQ 100. It was the strongest 4.5% last week. This is the NASDAQ composites advanced decline line. So this tells us that the most heavily weighted stocks drove the gains as has been the case most of 2020. Elsewhere, the participation, even though we got a bounce over here, was very, very low. And that wasn't just limited to NASDAQ stocks. This is a uh, S&P 500 here. There's the week's rally. And this is the percentage of NYSE stocks that are above their own 40 day moving average. So you can see again, a real plunge that did not recover. I still have my short on. I'm not worried about it at all. I constructed that position to have some duration to be able to last through some volatility like this and get out a couple months. I look at it like this. You have commodities like oil and copper that are bearish trend. They're showing a major growth slowdown, like almost a growth shock. Actually, you could say that a growth shock yields bearish trend, 
Growth and inflation slow down. Yield curve flattening inverted last week. Currencies like the Aussie bearish trend hitting multi-year, actually a decade plus low. And then you have stocks at all-time highs because the central banks had pumped a massive amount of liquidity in last week. For me, that's a no-brainer. You have very sophisticated markets like commodities, like bonds, and currencies that are all on the same page. Stocks are on a different page in la-la land. One of the focal points next week, Jerome Powell's testimony in front of Congress. Usually, the market drifts into these. Usually, they don't have a big impact on the market. This week could be interesting. And the reason is, is this week, Governor Scott, actually now Senator Scott, sent a list of five questions to Jay Powell before this testimony. Now, remember, he is compelled to answer the questions from Congress because Congress is the one that gives the Fed their mandate. This is my uh, response or my opinion. Question number three that he sent Jay Powell, what plans does the Federal Reserve have to shrink its balance sheet and bring asset holdings back into line with historic norms? So my point is, We've seen the financial media, the mainstream media catching on and saying, whoa, this market is being driven dangerously by liquidity. It's completely disconnected from fundamentals like earnings, like other asset classes, what they are saying, what their message is. And now we're seeing politicians that have power over the Fed asking these same questions. I will put a link to his five questions in the description below. So that will do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know it was long. If you have questions or comments, please leave them in the comment section below. I will do my best to get to them. And don't forget to subscribe so you know when videos come out. Uh, there should be a subscription link at the bottom right-hand corner at the end of the video, or you can see one below. Thanks for listening. Have a fantastic weekend. Have a great week, everybody. And members, I will see you on Monday.